Hello, I'm Santiago Gonzalez, and I'm here to present our paper, Improved Training Speed, Accuracy, and Data Utilization via Loss Function Optimization. This is work I've done with my advisor, Dr. Risto Mikulainen, at the University of Texas at Austin and at Cognizant Technology Solutions in San Francisco. So let's get started. So what are we going to cover today? First, some motivation and background literature to really understand why we want to tackle loss function optimization. This is a very new idea. Then we'll present our technique, genetic loss optimization, or GLOW for short. We will then present an evaluation and some really compelling results. And then we will go and do a deep dive analyzing one particular loss function that evolution was able to discover. And then we have some discussion points. So what's the problem? As the years have gone by, models have become increasingly more complex and challenging to train because they have many hyperparameters and many aspects that need manual fine tuning. And this can require special expertise and it's uh, very expensive and time consuming and also unscientific, even leading to many to call machine learning more of an art than a science in this respect. So this is all encompassed under this subfield called meta-learning. And meta-learning is a very wide field and it essentially just tackles how to optimize these different aspects automatically. And you can meta-learn anything from data set samplings to regularization, data augmentation pipelines, and other hyperparameters. But there's one thing that we found was missing from this list and it was a bit strange that it was missing. Loss functions. So we want to meta-learn loss functions. So really quick review, why we want to do loss functions. Loss functions embody the core training objective of a deep network or any neural network overall. We can take predictions and a set of corresponding labels and the loss function is able to provide a differentiable value that allows the network to learn. So this is really the core learning step in a neural network. So what is the state of loss functions today? There's a few different loss functions that are very widely used, such as the cross entropy loss for classification, mean squared error for uh, regression problems, and a few more specialized ones for more unique problems, such as sequence to sequence encoding. However, these are all hand selected functions and you oftentimes have some contrived statistical reasoning along with them as to why they work. So, some networks even have more than one loss function, such as generative adversarial networks. So we haven't found any work prior to this that automatically optimizes loss functions. As far as we know, we are the first people to do this. So how are we doing this? So now let's talk about GLOW, genetic loss optimization, our new technique. So we are leveraging EC. This is an EC conference after all. And we have these three main steps that everyone follows. We have to establish a search space, figure out our genetic representation and some evolutionary operators, and then we can evolve. So what does our search space look like? We are using functions composed of operators and tokens. And we have a selection that gives us a pretty wide range of functions that we can represent. We have multiplications, divisions, some unary operators such as logs, exponentiation, square roots. And then in terms of tokens, we have negative one, the number one, and then these X and Y variables, which represent the labels and the estimated labels. You'll note, we don't have any continuous values in here. These are all just discrete tokens. They are what they are and they don't change. So we'll talk about how we approach this limitation later. So we have these tokens and operators. How do we represent them? We have this bijection between functions and trees. Functions are implicitly these hierarchical structures, so we can very easily represent any function as a tree, with operators as non-leaf nodes and the tokens as leaf nodes. So what genetic operators are we using? So we are essentially performing sexual reproduction of equations. So we have mutation, which, which can happen on a structural and on a per node basis. And we also have genetic recombination, crossover. 
So crossover, it's particularly interesting. How exactly do you do this with trees? They're not really these string-based uh, structures like chromosomes in biology and in many other GA applications. So we just pretty much select a random point on each parent tree, and that's where we decide to splice the subtrees with each other, replacing them. So we get two children for each two set of parents, and they have different subtrees at these splice points. So that was our search space and our genetic representation and operators. Now we can evolve. So this will give us a really good structure of our loss function. However, I mentioned that we don't have any continuous value coefficients. So to tackle this limitation, we have another step in our evolution process. After evolving our structure, we then evolve coefficients to the different nodes in this structure using CMAES. So what do I mean by this? Well, given a function that is a tree, as you can see, we realize we implicitly have a one, an identity multiplication on each single node. So what if we just took all of these ones, put them into a vector, and then evolved the vector? That's exactly what we're doing with CMAES. So CMAES, covariance matrix adaptation, evolutionary strategies, are a really great family of algorithms. They're black box optimizers for continuous vector optimization. They operate by having a mean and a covariance matrix that represents a Gaussian distribution around this mean. This distribution and the mean gradually move and shift over generations to try to fit the distribution that you want and get the best result. So how does this end up working overall? We have an evolution of structure using a genetic programming inspired approach where our functions are modeled as trees. And then we have a second step where we perform continuous optimization on the coefficients that are implicitly in these structures. And this gives us two-step approach that gives us pretty good loss functions and then even better loss functions. So what do these results actually look like? Let's cover that now. But first, let's talk about how we're evaluating the system. There are numerous ways that a loss function could potentially be evaluated. In GLOW, we've chosen to determine loss function fitness through the validation accuracy of a neural network that has been trained with that specific loss function. We've chosen the MNIST handwritten digits classification task as a benchmark to use. This is a common benchmark in the literature and is a small enough data set that we can really quickly iterate and evaluate different experiments. So additionally, we're calculating fitness with just 10% of the number of epochs used in a full training run. While this may seem to give noisier estimates because it's early on in the training of a neural network, we find that it's actually pretty gratuitous because it encourages the development of loss functions that are able to reach a high level of accuracy early on in the training process. Now, we have all these components to the GLOW system. Let's actually evolve and see what happens. So one particular loss function that we found in a run of GLOW on MNIST is the Baikal loss. The Baikal loss, as you can see, is a very simple loss function with a log, a difference, and a division in it. And this lo loss function is interestingly able to get higher accuracy than the cross entropy loss. It's able to train faster than it, and it also achieves a lower root mean squared error than the cross entropy loss. And this is just after the first structural evolution step in GLOW. Once we do coefficient optimization, we get Baikal CMA with these specific values that give our function just a little bit extra performance. So what do these results actually look like quantitatively? On MNIST, we can see a very clear statistically significant increase in accuracy compared to the cross entropy loss when using Baikal and then subsequently Baikal CMA. So we see that each of these two stages in the GLOW process gives us a tangible improvement in accuracy just by swapping out the loss function. And this becomes even a little bit more evident when we look at the training curves. So you can see Baikal and Baikal CMA are able to reach higher levels of accuracy much earlier on than the log loss is able to, and they maintain a higher level of accuracy as the network converges. This is really encouraging. 
and it shows one of the benefits of training to 10% of the full number of epochs. We also have better data utilization with these loss functions. When we compare the testing accuracy of these different loss functions on different samplings of the uh, training data set, we can see that we have a lesser degradation in performance when using BICOL and BICOL CMA than the cross entropy loss. So you can see on the rightmost column, this is just training with 250 samples of the data set. This is really impressive. You're able to get over 90% accuracy with just 250 samples just by using one of these loss functions. And these loss functions also transfer pretty well to CIFAR 10. While the increase in performance isn't as great, this is a much more complex task of natural image classification with larger images additionally. We can see we have higher levels of performance early on, and as we converge, we still have a roughly 1% increase in testing accuracy. So this is just one of the loss functions that you can get out of GLOW. What are some of the implications of these results? We find that training to optimize a certain loss function is not necessarily the best way to optimize that specific quantity. Certain loss surfaces are nastier than others, and this allows us to do better than the standard cross-entropy log loss. But there's still a big remaining question. Why do some of these loss functions work better? And for that, we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into the BICOL loss function. So let's take a look at how we can visualize the log loss on MNIST specifically. We can take away this constant component, and we know that x and y are simply these 10-dimensional vectors. We know that they sum to 1 because they're outputs of a softmax, their classification probabilities. And then we can see that we have a very simple function in many parameters. This isn't going to be very trivial to plot, is it? We can try to simplify the problem down from 10 classes to just 2. And this will make this a binary classification loss. Here the vectors have become much simpler. This allows us to simplify the loss into this simple function. Here we finally have a function in two variables that have very clear meanings. What if we plot this then? We get this very nice saddle-shaped surface when we try to plot the log loss. And what we really care about are these blue curves in the front and back that specify the loss curves for each of the two classes. And you can see in this front blue curve, the closer we get to the target value, the lower our loss is. This is what we would expect. The better our predictions are, we would want lower losses. Now, let's take a look at the BICOL loss function under the same analysis modality. We have this channel-shaped surface, which has much different curves at the front and back. We see something very unexpected arise at the end of the front curve. Now, let's look at one of the classes specifically, just to really make this clear. So you can see the log loss is monotonically decreasing whereas BICOL and its optimized BICOL CMA variant have a very strange U-shape. What this would mean is that if you have perfect classifications in your network, you have near infinite loss. This is not what you would expect. So what's the reason behind this? After digging a bit deeper, we find that there's an implicit regularization effect that's going on, and this is what BICOL contributes. By preventing the network from being overly confident in its activations, we are able to smooth out the network and have a really good regularization effect, as you can kind of see in these two histograms. Now, we've gone over the GLOW technique, some pretty compelling results, and some analysis into why these loss functions work the way they do. Now let's wrap things up with a bit of discussion. Loss function optimization is a new form of meta-learning and it works. This is an entirely new avenue of meta-learning, and we're really excited to see how this is going to develop in the future. GLOW leverages evolution to discover loss functions that improve various performance characteristics of a network, from accuracy to data utilization. One such function, BICOL, was discovered on MNIST and achieves this through an implicit regularization effect that it discovered on its own. GLOW loss functions are also customizable to different domains but can still transfer. So you don't have a one-size-fits-all loss function. You can have custom-tailored functions. 
So thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. Please feel free to reach out with any questions, comments, or interesting ideas you might have. Thank you.